Thanks, Peter. Um, maybe just as we're turning to our Bibles, um, maybe a um, little reminder announcement, perhaps. Um, we know we're living in the world of mobile phones. In fact, uh, Kathy was just commenting the other day as she was watching children coming out of school that uh, of the first 20 that came out, um, all 20 were holding their phones and 18 were actually on the phone the moment they were coming out of school. Um, and we know that's what life is like. Um, but <clears throat> um, we don't all have to be glued to it. And today here as we're just uh, shutting ourselves away from the world and all the other things that are happening, um, we, we try to just say, OK, let's open up our Bibles and just see what the Lord has for us. And um, this is not to make anybody feel guilty who's using their phone today, but it's a better habit to not use your phone uh, because phones have all sorts of messages come in them. And sometimes people even get distracted in a meeting, sending messages back and forth, and uh, they end up missing out what they're here for. Uh, so uh, maybe it's also a, a thing of consideration for those alongside you who don't really want to watch you sending messages back and forth. They're just here to worship the Lord. So let's be our brother's keeper, shall we, and sort of go, hey, um, let's just concentrate if uh, anybody's getting uh, distracted that way and uh, keep each other focused in what the Lord wants us here for today. So uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 13. By the way, uh, it really was a revival concert last night. It was, uh, well, the whole event, it was, it was really special. Thanks for those who put the work in there. But it was uh, you know, typical of, of our style. It was, it was um, food, fun, fellowship, and the gospel went out. All the people said. Uh, there was an, a, a good number of people here for the first time and uh, were able to see us um, just in how we operate and to be able to uh, hear testimonies and, and to see what the Lord can do in their lives. So I um, just want to talk today about uh, a topic uh, that if I could title it I'd say um, finding a new life. Um, I was chatting to somebody yesterday and um, Sometimes um, people have um, even tasted of what the new life is here and they've walked away from it. Maybe they haven't really grabbed hold of what it was like. In fact, our sister was just talking about that in her very frank testimony. And, um, the, um, and, and often the battle for them is when they might try to um, you know, come back to it because they, 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 they might end up in a point where they're really sorry and the person I was speaking to was actually really sorry for uh, where he was at and saying, you know, I could have had the life that is here but I look at my life now and, and I, I've got all the things that the world is offering but none of them are doing me any good. And, and I, can, I can have sort of wine, women and song sort of thing, but none of it is giving me a real fulfilment and, and love inside. And so there's this emptiness for all of the, um, the fact that, uh, you know, the world is saying, here, come try this, come try that. You can really uh, have a great life. And, and you'll, feel, you'll feel renewed by the things that, you know, we offer you in this corner or that corner. Um, but uh, I think often the difficulty for a person like that, or even someone who has never known the gospel, to find a new life means that there, is, there does have to be a point where you break away from your old life. And that's often the challenge. Because the new life can sit in front of you and you can say, I want that. But if you say, I want that, but I actually also want this, then therein lies the problem because the two things are not going to match together. 
And I just want to look at a few scriptures maybe that highlight this a bit and uh, uh, but also maybe just sharing a little bit uh, first of all of my my own family story that uh, uh, of my parents uh, looking for a new life many years ago and uh, I know many people here know uh, bits and pieces of that story but um, maybe just touching on it my uh, my parents were born in Rotterdam in in the Netherlands um, this very very large port um, one of the largest in the world it and Singapore I think um, compete with each other and um, so life could have been just a, a very enjoyable life around uh, the shipping and, and um, family. My mother came from a big family. She was the eldest of eight children. And, um, but it, it wasn't to be sort of the ideal life that they would have liked because uh, the depression came along and that meant hardship for the family. And then... Uh, Holland was one of the first to f first countries to fall in the Second World War, and um, and Rotterdam in particular was bombed, um, as we used to say, to smithereens. It was uh, not the whole lot, but there was a lot of it that was seriously bombed all around where my mother and father lived, and quite amazingly, they survived both of them, and at that stage, uh, uh, so trying to think of their ages, maybe mum was about 18 and dad 20 um, when that happened, somewhere around that age. So picture yourselves, those who are 18, 20 years old, uh, that, that that's what's happening around you. There are people, people in the Ukraine at the moment who would know that feeling. And um, so all of a sudden everything is turned on its head and, um, and there, were, there were times when um, because of... Uh, uh, the underground, doing things against the, the Nazi regime, that um, uh, a group of men, young men, would be just taken out into the square and shot. And my dad, of course, was the age where you would, you would look for a man like that and say, you know, he'll be part of it because he might be working uh, with others, you know, as a young man. Um, fortunately for him, that didn't happen. He was taken away as labour force uh, across to Germany and he saw the war out uh, driving trams over there um, and there's quite a story to all of that but mum um, on the other hand was uh, she ended up in a, a boarding house where she was working and uh, soldiers were coming in and out and she had bad things happen to her uh, at that time and, uh, and after the, sh shortly after the war as well, and I won't go into all the details now, but their, their lives were not what you would call ideal. And so they met, uh, they worked in the same printing factory uh, after the war, and um, they, uh, I think somebody helped my dad, who had a bit of a stutter, to uh, take mum out skating along the, along the uh, frozen canals. And um, mum wasn't short of a word, so they got on all right. And um, anyway, um, eventually mum just wanted out and a new life, like too many bad memories and, and, um, and Australia looked like a good option. And so um, she and dad, uh, with their three sons, I, I was... Uh, um, whatever, one and a half, I think, at, at the time. Um, I didn't get a vote. And uh, Tom was, I think, about seven-ish. I'm looking for Tom. Um, and um, so, and my other brother, um, uh, maybe six, and five or six. And um, so they, they came out for a, a new life, out to Australia and, and uh, with a great hope. And of course, uh, I guess the normal things that you do when you go to a new country is you look for things that uh, uh, are familiar. And uh, Dad got work down in Narracourt in the southeast in a little country town there uh, in the, the, uh, uh, for the Narracourt Herald, which has just closed, I think, recently. And um, 
So while they were there, Mum sought out two things, I think, in particular. One was people in the Dutch community, uh, and others, of course, had come across. And the other thing was a church, because she was uh, a, a believer in God and wanted to uh, continue to follow that. And um, so she was sort of trying to you know, make her roots here, remembering that back in those days, a phone call or a visit back to Holland was... A visit was almost impossible. A phone call was very, 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 very costly, for those who might remember that. Um, you know, we have these advantages now. You can ring... If you've got a good deal, you ring for nothing. Um, and um, so she's left all her family behind... And she was very family-minded, but she's left all that behind to try for a new life. But when she comes here, it doesn't sort of all pan out that way. And um, she becomes sick with cancer. And, um, and that, uh, I mean, fortunately, and that's a longer story, she, she got a healing when somebody prayed for her for that. Uh, but then eventually one day, she bumped into Sister Heather Rowley that some of you will know. And uh, Heather was actually going to the same Church of Christ here in Adelaide. We'd moved back up to the city. And, um, and Heather herself had come from a broken marriage, uh, three young boys, and uh, she was looking for the Lord. And she came to the Revival Fellowship and she uh, was excited and, and she was just wanting to share that with Mum. And so Mum uh, um, went with her to find out you know, what Heather had got into. And, um, and when she came, it just amazed her what she saw uh, at a revival camp as it was. And she realised that she had finally found the truth. And uh, she was... Uh, and, and I mean, when I say the truth, I don't mean her truth. <laughs> you know, the new saying. I reckon that's something you should try on at school, students, you know. You go to your maths teacher when you get the answer wrong and you say, well, that's my truth. <laughs> or physics, that's my truth. And see how you go. Um, um, don't say your pastor said to do that. <laughs> but that's what people do these days about important truths in life, you know. It, it might be a lie, but they say, well, that's my truth. And um, so anyway, Mum found... That she, uh, she was just so excited. She got baptised straight away. She received the Holy Spirit and Dad followed suit. He, he got baptised, um, you know, almost straight away and received the Holy Spirit. And, um, and things just started to, to turn around in a hurry. And um, I might just read a scripture <laughs> before I go on a bit further. Matthew 13 and uh, verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man has found, he hides, and for joy thereof goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. And the second little parable in verse 45, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and bought it. Now, in a sense, mum and dad had tried that principle when they left Holland and left all that they had and came to Australia. But that was for a natural hope. It wasn't a spiritual hope. It didn't have God in it. But when they came to a revival meeting, and this time uh, in front of them is, is a better hope than just, you know, Australian culture and nice beaches... Is something more enduring uh, than that. And so uh, they saw what was, was offered to them and they hopped in straight away into getting baptised, into receiving the Holy Spirit. And then the following actions from that was to go back to the church that they had come from and to talk to their minister. And they, I guess, naively, um, hopefully thought everybody in the church will want to know this. Anybody else been there? Uh, hi, Heather. Didn't know you'd be here today. <laughs> um, and, um, and so they go back to the minister and he says to them, well, we've had people come here before 
talking about speaking in tongues and it divided our church. So uh, if you don't mind, see you later. Don't come Sunday. And um, mum was very involved in the church and uh, they did meet up with a couple of other families that they knew very well to tell them what had happened to them and that all shut off as well. No more friendship, no more friendship, no more contact from those people, didn't want to know them. And so it sort of became fairly easy then to leave it all behind. They'd realised that 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 wasn't where their answer was. They, they, they tried that. That, w- that was their hope before. But now that they'd really come to know the Lord and said, well, do you want to come with us? These people say no. So, right, okay, we leave it behind. We, in a sense, we sell all we have for what lies before us because we, we can see that, that this is our answer. And so they just uh, were totally in and so I watched this unfolding at home as mum and dad started to go to meetings and, and just come home with stories. And uh, mum had been pretty disturbed about um, her three sons and where they were headed, particularly her eldest son. She was rather worried about where he was headed. Um, but after she came to the Lord, all of a sudden, none of that touched her anymore. Now, I think that her life had been trying to rescue us. And she, she was worried. She was worried about Dad as well. And her life before that had been, what can I do to t- try to get my family to believe in God? And, and finally, when she comes to know the Lord herself, she actually stops that chase and leaves it alone. Because, I don't know, somehow the Lord gave her peace about it. And it was like she just had a protection zone around her. And the best thing she could have done for us was what ended up happening was that she just went all in with the Lord and just said, if you want to find out, come and have a look. And uh, that was the best thing could have been said to me. Um, Her eldest son was a bit more stubborn, but, you know, (laughs) finally he came to the Lord. Took a few years and hallelujah for that. And uh, now wild horses wouldn't tear him away, as we know. Praise the Lord for that. So I ended up coming along with Cathy. Um, we'd um, pretty well and truly broken up as a couple. We weren't married, but we were very close for four or five years. And, and, um, and all of that got healed for one reason, because, again, once we saw what was in, ahead of us, the things that were our valuable pearls before, you know, the sporting career that I wanted. All of a sudden, I went back to the the guys that I was playing with and said, guys, actually, I've got something better. And they wanted to persuade me to come back, and I said, no, I'm done. And, and, And something I'd pursued for years to try to, you know, do well at at my chosen sport of basketball and to see where it could take me, all of a sudden it was, it was over like that. It was over overnight. And the, uh, the things that Cathy and I might have gone to, the, the parties that we might have been invited to and the, the drinking and the lifestyle, again, it was over like that. We just we didn't go back to it. We didn't seek it out. We, we, I don't think we even got invited. Maybe family. Um, but... It was just a new life. There we were, baptised, spirit-filled, and we were all in. This was our new life. And we got to know a whole bunch of people who were prepared to be our friends. They weren't fussy. (laughs) Thank you for that. And we would sit and share stories and, and share, like we've just heard in testimony, of the heartaches and then the peace of God and the victories and the things that where where people triumph over their difficulties and it just lifted us and and we really lived this scripture not because we were that clever not at all we we saw it modeled in front of us and we saw these scriptures laid out for us that this was the only way it could work that you couldn't have your foot in two camps it would never ever work with your foot in two camps And so it just sort of became something very, very special to us. Let's go to Matthew 6. Verse 
and um, we'll start in verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust does corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye, if therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. It's a little picture here that if our eyes are tuned to those things that are good, then our whole life will be full of it. But then in verse 23, but if thine eye be evil, or looking at things that are not good, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? In other words, if the darkness you are looking at convinces you that it's actually good, then you're in a bad place. Because it's saying here that if you're fooled that darkness is actually light, because that's how the world is today. Every dark thing, people say, this is the new light. This is the new life. And if you're fooled to think that that is what is actually good for your eyes, it says, how great is that darkness? That is a real blindness to be in that position where, where it's convinced you to that point. And, of course... You know, we've been in that position. Sure, many of us have been in that position. And verse 24, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or wealth or the riches of this world. You you can't have them both. If, If you want to be a millionaire... I don't know if coming to the Lord's going to do it for you. But as we sing, you'll be richer than a millionaire in things that really matter, as it talks about here, laying up treasure in heaven and, and putting treasures in your life that you'll never, ever be sorry about. And you'll find the love of God, the joy, the peace, qualities that money does not buy. You know, wouldn't it be nice to go to the shop? Can I do pay wave for about uh, six weeks of love Or maybe can I pay a bit more and get a whole year? I mean, you can't buy it. People people want to in some way or other. You can't buy it. And and so the Lord is telling us here, okay, which master do we want? Which one do we want to serve? Um, Little confession. Kathy and I went to um, uh, York Peninsula for a few days. And uh, while we were there, we stopped into a little town, quiet little town, 800 people, Minleton. And, um, and I happened to gaze in the, the window of a church. I was just, you know, we've got a coffee, you know, walking in the street and looking inside to see if this people actually go, look, does it look like people actually go to this church or not? Anyway, a lady came up to me and um, told me a bit about the five churches in town, which all have maybe about 30 people and um, five churches for a community of 800. And um, anyway, so we got talking about the Lord. And um, I actually thought maybe there's a bit of interest here. And um, being the dreamer that I can be at times, I thought, oh, I wonder what could happen here. And anyway, uh, so we gave details and, and then she invited us to something. Uh, the next night and they were cooking some pancakes a a group of people in the Anglican church and and I thought well I'm never going to see her again I wonder if we might just go and uh, things we do on holidays and so I said to Kathy uh, what do you reckon you know it's this little hall sort of out around the back of the Anglican church there somewhere and um, so anyway I said, we went and said to Kathy, what do you think it's going to be like? She said, oh, a women's guild, I think. And um, anyway, so we went in and there was, there was about 30 of them, uh, I think mostly older than us. And uh, the first response was, oh, you came. Nobody ever comes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, 
we went in there and had some nice pancakes and, and so on. But what happened was that the, the priest, pastor, whatever they call him, he, uh, he gets up and he's got a bottle, a bottle of wine in his hands. And he says, um, look, I'm not trying to sell this to you, but recently, you know, been to McLaren Vale, it's a really good wine, and I'd just like you to all taste it for free tonight, and uh, if you want to buy some, you can come and buy it. Now, at our table, they didn't want any of the wine because they all had their own beers. <laughs> like I say, this is a bit of a confession. <laughs> we didn't have one. And... Um, and anyway, the guy I was chatting to next to me had somebody very unwell in the family, so I told him a healing of my mum. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, some people get healed, but a lot of people don't. So I thought, well, that's not going to go much further. Um, and then eventually we got to tell our testimony. Uh, they asked us about travel. Do we travel much? And I said, well, I'll tell you a place I really enjoy travelling. It's Papua New Guinea. So in we go with a few stories. And we got the floor, one testimony after another. And there was a couple of questions, but when it was done, it was done. No more interest. No more interest. So we didn't stay long. <laughs> but I just thought, you know, people choose, don't they? And I, when we left, I said to Cathy, I think we've just been to the local yacht club. No one wanted to talk about God. Wine, beer, life, sure. Um, what are we made of? You know, that's not what we're made of. We, we try and shine a light in a dark place. And sometimes there are people wanting to hear it. And, and you know, we're looking for them. We're trying to find them. Um, let's go to Matthew chapter 25. So, um, on, uh, maybe there's two parts to this, what I'm talking about today. There's, there's people who are here for the first time, or maybe been to a few meetings, and uh, you haven't yet found out what this new way of life is. And maybe the challenge for you is today, are you prepared to give yours up? It's a trade-in. That is the way it works. God's offering you the very best, but he says, my son has laid his life down. He has forgiven your sin. All you have to do is come up and accept it, but at the same time, he wants you to lay your ideas aside. Whatever they are, you know, whether you believe in astro travel or, or I don't know, anything in this life, that you, you think is going to be the answer. You say, okay, my ideas, I'm prepared to bury them in the waters of baptism. That's what baptism is about. And then I'll come and I'll take hold of the new life. You can't do a trade-off. You, you can't sort of say, well, Lord, yeah, look, I like the meetings, I like the people, I don't mind coming here and hearing a bit of this and that, but I'm still going to do other things my way. It's not going to work with God. No man can serve two masters. No man can serve two masters. So that means that if we've got our head in two places, we're going to be double-minded. Which way do I think on this? Which way do I think on that? Double-minded is another way I think of saying half-hearted. You know, do I go this way, do I go that way? But once we make that very clear break, and praise the Lord for this room full of people today that have made that very clear break and said, no more of the world for me. No more of the world's philosophies. No more of the world's religions. I just want to follow the Lord. And you know what? A hundred lifetimes wouldn't give you everything that he can give you. One lifetime's pretty good. But we're going to go into the eternities with him. There is so much that he wants to uh, have us enjoy and to understand and to benefit from. But now I, I just want to have a little bit of thought too for those of us who've been in the Lord maybe best part of our life perhaps some have uh, 
there's quite a number here who have grown up coming to this fellowship and uh, and as life has gone along um, you know they've started out as you do start out life single and uh, gives you a bit of a head start and then you you learn things in life and then you you know if you're coming along here uh, often at a, uh, quite a young age 8, 10, 12, 14 receive the Holy Spirit get baptised and very happy with the life that you have um, but then things start to get a little more complicated because uh, you need a job and so life gets a little bit busier and you might across a crowded room discover somebody that actually doesn't mind looking your way as well they don't look away you know they're, they're happy to come with you and all of a sudden you've got a job and a marriage and then other amazing things happen a child comes or two or three or four you know some hang around for a long time more kids good on them but that builds more and more complexity into your life and then all the needs of the children and what happens here and what happens there their studies and their interest in sport or music and and life all of a sudden has become this huge snowball gathering pace or other things might happen after we've come to the Lord you know we come come to the Lord at an older age um, or maybe we've been in the Lord a long time and, and further down the track maybe uh, tragedy strikes or um, health is not our best friend and we're, we're finding that we're having to spend more time each day to look after our own health than we actually really want to we would love to be spending more time with other people but we've got this thing in our life that we've got to deal with or maybe there's some tragedy that is occupying our mind and and the simplicity of just, you know, walking on in life isn't quite as simple as what it was before. And but I, I, I wanted to just sort of take a hold of this parable here in uh, Matthew 25, considering the fact that Jesus knew what would happen to us when he gave us this parable. So let's just have a look um, in um, verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man travelling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two and to another one. To every man according to his several ability and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise he that had received two he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought another five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five. Behold, I've gained beside them five more. And his Lord said to him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou in the joy of thy Lord. And he also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou delivered to me two, I've gained two. And his Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant, thou hast been faithful over a few things, I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. And his Lord answered and said to him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gathered where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchanges, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with interest, usury. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which has ten. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. From, from, but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now that's a, a pretty heavy punishment at the end of all of this. But the, the picture of this parable 
is of people who are servants to God. All called and given this great opportunity and, and loaded up with benefits. And the Lord's saying, okay, go out and use it. Now, we know from other scriptures that the Lord says there will be hardship along the way. It's not like this story is uh, unrealistic, that it's only going to be smooth sailing. We know from scriptures elsewhere that there were going to be difficulties in, in using your talents and seeing how the Lord would bless it. And often, as we know, our biggest blessings come through our hardest trials. And as much as we don't want the hard trials, they're the times where we're more on our knees and more seeking the Lord and trying to find guidance from what he can give when we come for fellowship uh, because we have the need. And, and yet, for all of this, the picture we get of these three here is that two of them have really not allowed circumstances to change their direction. And so they have reaped the rewards of that. They've just said, I'm going to serve the Lord no matter what. No matter what, I'm just going to keep serving him. Even though I've got this and this and this that's happened to me along the way. Of course, our great example, as we know, is Jesus, who suffered more than any and was not prepared to be stopped because he knew what it was going to achieve for us. But then we got this one here, and um, we read about him, in the third one, in verse 25, uh, sorry, 24. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that thou art a hard man. His, his picture was, this is a really tough job. Not like the others who, who just seemed to get joy out of it and in the end joy was given to them. But his, his picture is, no, nah, this is too tough, can't do this. And the interesting thing is, it's, it's almost like the Lord didn't even make it that hard for him. He said, I'm just going to give you one. See what you can do with the one. And he said, no, no, it's too hard. It's too hard. And I suppose that uh, one of the things we, we've all probably got to uh, hope we learn in our walk in the Lord is that while we do have our life get maybe more complex as we go on in, in our walk in the Lord is that how can we keep it simple? How can we trim what we need to trim and make those things that are most important stay most important? Because otherwise we could end up like the guy who just says, it's all too hard. It's all too hard. And, what, and, and, and we've seen it happen to people where they've found themselves busied here or knocked down by that or whatever, and, and, and all of a sudden, the joy of the Lord is gone. That, that initial joy. And we're talking here today about not only getting a new life, but keeping it new. That it stays that way. And, and so, in difficult times, the Lord wants our joy still to be strong. And, and he's the one who knows how that can work. Because we read in Hebrews, it says, "...who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross." So he knows how it works. And when we hear testimonies here of people who, as we did yesterday and we keep hearing and today, where, where people are, are faced with an incurable disease or in, faced with a broken marriage or faced with kids leaving or, or whatever, and they've said, OK, the Lord says he will look after the righteous. I'm just going to throw myself before the Lord and see how the Lord will lift me out of this and keep me feeling new keep me feeling happy, keep me feeling like an overcomer, which is his great desire for us all. Um, I want to just uh, touch on Acts chapter 16. And in verse um, 12, I, I just want to give a couple of examples 
of the early church here and, uh, and just how they went about things. And, and it, it, again, it wasn't without difficulty. In verse 12, from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia and a colony, uh, and we were in that city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple and the, uh, of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptised in her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Now, the backstory of this is that Paul is uh, travelling with Timothy, I think at this stage, and maybe Silas. Um, and they are, they've decided that our life is for the Lord. What can we do to go and serve the Lord? And wherever they went... <laughs> They found conflict, but it didn't seem to stop them. And in fact, it seemed to almost propel them. And, and here, they, they're not having much luck, and, but they find this woman whose heart was really searching after the Lord. And she turns out to be of the same mould. Now, she's a busy businesswoman, seller of purple um, from Thyatira, so she wasn't in her own location doing business. But... Um, she must have had a house there because she says, come and stay at my house. And, uh, and she just, she follows the model in front of her, says, come to my place. Now, Paul and Silas then get thrown into jail shortly after this. And when they get let out, we just read of it in verse, four, uh, verse 39. And they came and besought them and brought them out and desired them to depart out of the city. And they went out of the prison and entered where? The house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. Door open. This is my life now. These people, I might be risking it. They've been prisoners. They've been, people have been fighting against them here in this town. And, but she had made this her family. These are my people. We're working together for the same cause. Um, also, chapter 20. Paul's continued journeys in verse 6. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came uh, unto them to Troas in five days where we abode seven days. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together, and there sat in a window a young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep, as we know happens to some people when talks are happening. Be careful where you sit. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. That's a long way to fall. And Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves for his life is in him. And when he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till break of day, you think we go for a while. So he departed and they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. What a zeal there was here for people to hear the word of God. They couldn't get enough of it. Does this sound like a hardship or a joy? Even the accident that happened didn't stop them. And, and the Lord used the opportunity to raise up the man. Because here were people who had discovered new life. They, they, they had discovered how this new life works. And they just wanted more of it. And the world wants to call us into all the things about establishing us in this life. And if you haven't got the, the best car and the best house and the, you know, God bless you if you've got it nicely set up. But if you seek after those things as treasures, if you seek after the entertainment of this world as treasures, look out. It'll steal your heart. And no man can serve two masters. If you say, I can walk in the Lord and I can have all of that, something's going to give. Somewhere, something's going to give. It's either going to be you're going to have to give up on the Lord 
or you're going to have to trim your other pursuits because if you want to continue for your life to feel new you've got to give it your all there isn't any other way and if you're here for the first time today we hope this is the life you want to take up all the people said Pastor Chess